Welcome back. I'm Ian Masters, and this is Background Briefing, available 24-7 at backgroundbriefing.org. And joining us now is Dennis Kelleher, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Better Markets, Inc., a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit organization that promotes the public interest in the U.S. and global financial markets. Better Markets is a Wall Street watchdog and has been referred to as, quote, a persistent thorn in the side of Wall Street. Welcome to Background Briefing, Dennis Kelleher. Hi, Ian. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for joining us, uh, Dennis. And in terms of whether or not there's a contagion following the collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank, one of the sort of big names on Wall Street, Larry Fink, uh, the head of BlackRock, uh, said that the SVB collapse may be the start of a slow rolling crisis. Do you see it that way? Well, it's completely unclear at this point. It should be remembered that today actually is the 15th anniversary of the collapse of the Bear Stearns Investment Bank in 2008. That happened on March 15th of 2008, and everybody thought that the rescue that was engineered uh, for that particular bank, it basically collapsed and was sold for next to nothing to J.P. Morgan Chase with uh, the, the U.S. taxpayers on the hook for about $30 billion dollars. Um, But when that was done in uh, March of 2008, people thought that the crisis was stemmed and that uh, things were going to stabilize. And, of course, we now know that uh, uh, during the summer things got worse. And by September 15th of 2008, Lehman crashed and we had the worst financial crash since 2000 or 1929. So uh, I think people should be standing watch and not being overly optimistic about handling what is happening or not happening. Uh, We have a serious uh, seriously fragile financial system at the moment, uh, both in the United States and around the globe. And the crash and collapse of Silicon Valley Bank um, was an illustration of that. The failure of Signature Bank um, was a sign of that. The current uh, concerns about Credit Suisse, a uh, globally systemically significant bank in Switzerland, uh, is right now attempting to be addressed by the Swiss authorities. So we'll just have to see how this plays out. But I think uh, people need to be um, uh, realistic that uh, this is not a one or a two bank issue. This is a banking system financial issue. And it is because we had just got through four plus years of deregulation of the financial industry under the Trump administration. And they didn't just deregulate two banks. They deregulated the financial industry. And when you deregulate the financial industry, they increase their risky activities, which increases their bonuses, which increases their profits, which makes them happy. But it endangers uh, the financial system and, frankly, all Americans. Well, a lot of Democratic senators, of course, voted in 2018 for, for the Trump administration's rollback on regional banks having stress tests and having to have more capital on on the books, and they reduced that liability or that requirement. You know, Cinema Mansion, Tim Kaine, who was the vice president from running running mate for Hillary Clinton, Warner. Well, that's that that's true. Um, there was a law in 2018 passed on a bipartisan basis that uh, loosened the regulations on the banks, but it has to be understood that that was just one part of the overall deregulation juggernaut of the Trump administration. And while that was an important part, not just because of its specific provisions, but also because it sent the wrong message. And the message was banks like Silicon Valley Bank that were under $250 billion couldn't be systemic. They weren't systemic. Well, Better Markets was there at the time opposing that. We demonstrated with facts, evidence, and data that those size financial institutions, in fact, are a systemic risk. But nonetheless, Congress passed that and and loosened some regulations. And then the Federal Reserve, under Chairman Powell and Vice Chairman Quarles, uh, Trump's two key appointees to the Federal Reserve, uh, took that law and enacted rules that deregulated the financial industry even more. Um, But those rules were only one of more than 20 rules that were passed by the Federal Reserve deregulating the banks. And they didn't just deregulate them, they also weakened the supervision of the banks. 
Um, the Federal Reserve has two big jobs, actually more than two, but the two that are relevant here is the regulation of the banks and the supervision of the banks. And on the supervision of the banks, the banking regulators have thousands of employees who often don't go to work at regulatory agencies. They literally go to the banks and examine the bank's operations. And their job is to make sure that the banks are operating in a safe and sound manner and are not a threat to financial stability. That's the duty of the Federal Reserve supervisors. And they were supposed to be doing that at Silicon Valley Bank. And if the Silicon Valley Bank executives and directors were reckless or irresponsible in running that bank inappropriately, which they clearly appear to have done, then the Federal Reserve supervisors were supposed to be there stopping that. They have a full panoply of tools and weapons to make sure that banks, executives, and directors don't run their banks in a way that pose a threat to safety and soundness. So the 2018 law was important, but it shouldn't obscure the larger story was that it was only one piece of an overall deregulation juggernaut done by the Trump administration across the entire range of the financial industry. But Dennis, my understanding is that the fallout from the Silicon Valley Bank's failure is also resonating in Europe, and the European banking sector is uh, apparently a little unstable and somewhat threatened. And you mentioned Credit Suisse, the possibility it could collapse. The Saudi investors basically said, no, we're not going to throw any more good money after bad. So that's a bad sign. Nouriel Roubini, of course, famous for predicting the 2008 crash, said that if Credit Suisse were to collapse, it would result in a Lehman Brothers moment. Uh, Would you agree with that? I think it depends upon... um how that happens uh it's part of the problem with european banks is they are often referred to as um, national champions which is to say there are countries that um are overly invested not in the technical sense of investing but in the psychological and nationalistic sense overly invested in having big banks and switzerland has two very big banks Frankly, they're so big that the entire country uh, probably couldn't bail them out. And similarly, Germany has the national champion of Deutsche Bank. Uh, France has theirs and the U.K. has theirs. And the problem when you have uh, banks that you think are important to your entire country, they're by definition too big to fail. And that means too often that when they engage in high risk and irresponsible behavior, they are not properly regulated. Um, because they get special treatment from their governments. And so when they get into trouble, uh, it the uh, implications uh, ripple throughout not just Europe, but the globe. And so the Swiss authorities have already said that they're going to provide whatever liquidity is necessary. Um, there are people already talking about a, for, a forced merger between Credit Suisse and UBS, the other big Swiss bank. But the problems that are manifesting now with Credit Suisse, um, unfortunately, are not limited to Credit Suisse. Now, some the Credit Suisse has got some unique characteristics, just like Silicon Valley Bank had some unique characteristics, but they also have uh, characteristics that are common with other banks. And one of the problems that uh, many of these banks are having is the increases in interest rates by um, central banks, the Fed in the United States and the ECB in Europe, is that it's causing the repricing of assets across the entire yield spectrum, whether they're treasuries that are two-year treasuries or they go all the way out to 30-year mortgages or junk bonds. Every asset, financial asset that these banks have in their portfolios and that they trade and um, engage in a variety of activities, all of those assets are being repriced because interest rates are going up after many years of interest rates being almost zero, the Fed uh, in the United States has raised interest rates um, four and a half percent in about six months. That is a pace um, and amount that's almost unprecedented. And that means that um, you see bubbles bursting, the stock market bubble, uh, the crypto bubble, uh, the PE bubble. Um, These were bubbles created by the Fed's basically their zero interest rate policy 
that they started after the last crash. And so in some ways, the seeds of the current crisis that basically were planted by Federal Reserve policy over the last 14, 15 years since the 2008 crash. And you see these, all these financial assets are getting repriced to more accurately reflect the risk of those assets. And then when you have a bank like Credit Suisse or a bank like Silicon Valley Bank that has these assets that are being repriced, your, the problem is is that the value of those assets go down as interest rates go up and you end up incurring losses. And that usually is covered and should be covered by capital. But I'll go back to the point earlier, their capital isn't what it should be and their liquidity isn't what it should be because the Trump administration across the board uh, deregulated them, loosened the restrictions and weakened supervision so that they could get away with more high risk, dangerous activities. Well, Silicon Valley Bank, of course, has, you know, the FDIC bailed out depositors who had below $250,000. But they've also bailed out the big ones as well. And the biggest one of all was Circle. They had $3.3 billion on deposits at Silicon Valley Bank. And they're into crypto. So, Dennis, I just am really annoyed, and that's putting it mildly, with the idea that the government can't take care of students who have an unsupportable student loans, but they can bail out some goddamn crypto company. I, I don't get it. Well, you're right. There's, uh, it is incredibly unfair uh, when you're trying to stop uh, a, a, what's called contagion from a bank failure. And contagion is when a bank fails, if it fails in a disorderly fashion like Silicon Valley Bank, it could precipitate a bunch of other banks from failing and inflicting widespread damage on the financial system and the economy. And so unfortunately, when you are trying when you're in the middle of a crisis, you sometimes have to take action where incredibly undesirable people benefit. And that happened very broadly in 2008, where basically Wall Street and all the bankers who actually caused the crash ended up getting bailed out under the a rationale that it would have that was distasteful but it wasn't as bad as the second great depression now we could argue about that but what we what nobody can argue about is in 2008 uh, those bailouts were done with virtually no terms and conditions and there was absolutely no accountability for the many bankers and others who actually caused the crash who engaged in mismanagement reckless conduct often illegal and sometimes criminal conduct. They all got the money, they all got bailed out, and they all got away. And Main Street paid the bill. And this time, uh, the Biden administration is trying to uh, tailor and narrow uh, the programs to prevent contagion. And the president himself, as he said earlier this week, is going to demand accountability. And I think that that has got to be priority one through three, is that, okay, um, as I've said for many years, it's one thing if you have to save the banks, but damn it, don't save every damn banker. And in this case, Silicon Valley Bank, um, its failure reminds me of uh, the movie Murder on the Orient Express, because there were a number of causes of the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, and there were a number of contributors. And what that means is that there are a lot of people who should be held accountable. First and foremost, the directors and officers of Silicon Valley Bank appear to have acted with gross mismanagement and recklessness, if not engaging in illegal activity. And the Justice Department and the SEC and others are already intensely focused on reviewing their behavior. And we can only hope that those investigations will get to the bottom of their conduct and that they will be held accountable for what happened to that bank. But the bank directors and officers are supposed to be held in check by regulators. I says, as I said earlier, the Federal Reserve Banks, uh, the Federal Reserve Board's supervisors were supposed to be ensuring that this bank was operated in a safe and sound manner and not a threat to financial stability. And it's objectively true now that it was not operated that way and it was a threat to financial stability. They should have seen it. They should have stopped it. They didn't. The Federal Reserve supervisors appear to have been AWOL here. And there needs to be a full investigation 
of the Federal Reserve supervision, and it needs to be an outside independent investigator. Unfortunately, Chair Powell, the chairman of the Fed, announced uh, that the Fed was going to investigate itself and investigate its failures and report to the public in six weeks um, what they find. But that has all the earmarks of a cover-up and a whitewash, and he shouldn't be allowed to get away with that. The administration and everybody else should demand an independent, comprehensive, thorough, outside investigation of what happened to cause the failure of Federal Reserve supervision, report those facts to the public, and then take corrective action to make sure that it never happens again. There needs to be accountability here for those who caused it, principally the bankers, and those who should have seen it and stopped it, and that includes the regulators. And of course, the other thing that should happen quite quickly is that the regulations that the Trump deregulators put in place that enabled these banks to engage in such irresponsible, high-risk activities, those regulations need to be changed. Right now, the Federal Reserve should immediately begin to review and revise those regulations. And they can do that. They don't need an act of Congress. Um, They can do that on their own now. The 2018 law that you referred to earlier, Ian, that would require Congress to change the law. But with the Republicans controlling the House and the power and influence of the financial industry in Washington, D.C., the likelihood of meaningful, effective laws being passed to correct the, the mistakes of the Trump administration are quite low. And so we can't wait for Congress to get smart and act quickly. That's not going to happen. But the regulators, the Biden regulators, now have to go back, revi- review and revise the regulations that unleash these banks and put them in a position where they can endanger our financial system and our economy. So just in closing then, Dennis, along with the people that you've named that should be held accountable, it seems that people on television and the Wall Street economists and the people that cover Wall Street, in terms of picking stocks, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Securities, Jefferies, and Goldman Sachs were all just up until a couple of days before SVB collapsed, was saying what a great stock it was. And along with Jim Cramer of CNBC, he was saying SBC is one of the top 10 performers of 2023. So should they be held accountable? Well, you know, I think the American people uh, are smart enough not to listen to these hucksters who have uh, a rather remarkable record of being consistently wrong. And I think people have to pay attention to who's paying these mouthpieces. Uh, And I think if you look at the people who are advertising uh, and who's paying the salaries of these people, um, you know, uh, people ought to uh, really question the value of what they have to say. There's pretty poor accountability in the what I'll call the opinion business, be it on TV or be it at um, financial firms touting stocks. Um, We've learned repeatedly over the last several decades that um, most recommendations are incredibly unreliable and usually line up with whoever the mouthpiece's paymaster is. And I think people have to take caveat emptor and protect themselves by not listening to those people. Um, But there are plenty of people who need accountability. And you mentioned earlier the fact that Um, You know, Circle, a crypto firm, had $3.3 billion in uninsured deposits at Silicon Valley Bank uh, that are now being protected. Um, And uh, there there should be an investigation of these gigantic companies that put outsized uninsured deposits into this one bank in a way that would appear that they didn't do their due diligence Um, There are some of those who had money there that were fiduciaries. It's hard to see how somebody could have satisfied their fiduciary duties by putting large amounts of uninsured cash into a bank that was being operated in a flagrantly um, irresponsible way. And I should say that what happened at Silicon Valley Bank was not a secret. It was the the risks they were taking uh, and the vulnerabilities and the fragile nature of that bank were well known. 
on November 11th of 2022 on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, um, the vulnerabilities and risks at the Silicon Valley Bank were detailed and short sellers have been circling the bank for some time and they too have been identifying the vulnerabilities and it's been reported that Moody's was Moody's uh, rating agency was going to downgrade Silicon Valley Bank and that means the ra- ra- rating agencies knew sure. so the media is reporting on it short sellers are circling the rating agencies know it that means mm-hmm. this is easily knowable information and anybody who didn't act consistent with that should have their conduct scrutinized, evaluated, and there should be accountability. Well, Dennis, I thank you for so much for joining us here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Nice to talk to you. Likewise. And again, I've been speaking with Dennis Kelleher, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Better Markets, Inc., a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit organization that promotes the public interest in the U.S. and global financial markets. Better Markets is a Wall Street watchdog and has been referred to as, quote, a persistent thorn in the side of Wall Street. This has been Background Briefing. I'm Ian Masters. I'd like to thank producer Graham Fitzgibbon and assistant producer Asher Price. If you missed any of today's program and would like to explore our vast archives, you can find us at backgroundbriefing.org, where we include extended interviews searchable by topic and have made it easy for you to sign up for daily email updates that provide links to resources, articles, and books discussed on the program. Also, you can find links there to subscribe wherever you get your podcast, and we also encourage your ratings and reviews on these platforms. Find us on Twitter and Facebook at Ian Masters Media, and please do help us reach more listeners by sharing this program with friends, family, and colleagues. And to help us sustain this program into the future and ensure it remains free to all, please take a moment to support us by going to backgroundbriefing.org slash donate or to publictruthmedia.org where you will find our non-profit Public Truth Media Foundation, where your tax-deductible donations, large and small, keep us broadcasting. And I'll be back again tomorrow with another background briefing at backgroundbriefing.org. Bye for now. The guy that lived next door in 305 Took the kids to the park and disappeared by half past nine One more light goes out